I will invite Susan to give the first of the lectures. Okay, well, thank you very much for those uh, kind words of introduction. And I must say, when I was given this topic, um, I thought hard about what do you really want? So are those my potential conflicts of interest? Um, and really what I'm going to focus on is the vaccine trial data. I'm going to summarise the latest data. And really I'm going to spend more time on the outcomes post-vaccine deployment globally. So, in fact, thinking about this title took me back because it's almost 10 years to the day that the uh, seminal paper came out in the New England Journal by Laura Kautsky on the findings from the monovalent 16 VLP vaccine, and which, as you can see, um, had 100% efficacy in um, prevention of persistent 16 infection. And you can see uh, uh, this was highly significant. And again, if you read the editorial in that same article, and it's quite pertinent to note that um, Christopher Crum from Brigham and Women's said that maybe in our lifetime we should have potential profound effects. And he preempted reduction in genital warts, pap abnormalities, and 16 related neoplasias and really a substantial burden in healthcare costs related to uh, cancer prevention. So um, it's intriguing uh, that now here we are 10 years later and um, really, how has this translated? Well, obviously, there's been the phase three data from both the bivalent as well as the quadrivalent vaccines. And as I said, now some translation from public health programs. So that's all happened in our 10 years, which is actually a pretty short time um, when you think about medicine. And, and I remember very much when the trials, and I'm a, 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 an investigator of both the bivalent and the quadrivalent, and when the future trial first came out for discussion and, and uh, recruitment, we had a lot of challenges in terms of what did people really know about HPV. We had to really work hard to get the messages out to the community, to bring people into the studies and really talk about um, an infection for which a lot of these young women had no disease or no disease at the moment. And the sort of things that we looked at in terms of messages, um, which we did get past our ethics committee, was how to stay healthy down under. So really, just to summarise uh, the phase three data, because you all know this data, um, the, in the per protocol efficacy data for young women, so from 16 to 26, end of study data, and you can see here, this is for efficacy against 16 or 18, SIN23 or AIS, similarly for VIN23, um, and so it goes on. And you can see very high efficacies, tight 95%. Um, CIs, and then as you can see in blue down the bottom there, again in the male studies that were very similar to the future trials, uh, again um, efficacy for genital warts as well as for AIN of 16, 18 related. Now the uh, bivalent vaccine, the Patricia trial, efficacy in the end of study analysis for the total vaccinated cohort um, naive cohort, again for SIN2, SIN3+, 16, 18 related, you've got very high efficacy. And again, tight 95% CIs. So um, really, there are some differences in terms of the two vaccines. And um, I'm going to show you some uh, slides now, which you may not see at the, the detail in the back of the room. But I would like to draw your attention to this book, which is only just been um, born uh, at this meeting, um, for which Xavier Bosch, we must thank for his enormous efforts into it. But this actually has a lot of the detail that I'm going to uh, show you from one article that a couple of us worked with uh, John Schiller on, which shows you some of the differences. They're, they're both VLP based, there's a different adjuvant and a slightly different injection schedule, and also the uh, vector in which the VLPs are expressed are different. 
again, you probably can't see all of this, but this gives you the detail, so I suggest if you want to uh, review that, look at the inclusion criteria, exclusion criteria, countries involved. There are some differences in the nomenclature, whether they're used as according to protocol or per protocol population for efficacy. Um, they pretty much mean the same, but I think that the two groups use different nomenclature, perhaps to confuse us, but it's, it's um, detailed again in this article. As well, really, we summarised the key findings from the clinical trials for both of the vaccines as to what is proven um, or what is yet to come or, or not targeted. So again, I draw your attention to that. Um, so really, summarising the phase three trials, really most of the data has been expressed in efficacy from the vaccinated to non-vaccinated. And one, one concept we also focused on was the issue of absolute risk reduction. So in other words, number of new cases prevented per 100,000 women vaccinated. And in a way, that gives you more information uh, than the percent efficacy. And it also cuts out the issues around differences in trials where one may be a more naive population to another. So again, I'm um, showing you when you do this analysis uh, for the future trials, so for the quadrivalent vaccine, and you can see here for rate reduction in say SIN2, here it's at uh, 0 0.5. If you then look again at uh, the bivalent vaccine, you've got pretty much identical rate reductions. So I think when people will start comparing and contrasting the two vaccines, think again about what's the actual rate reduction within the population. So they're both very good vaccines. Again, I just put this slide up to say that when one really looks at the uh, serious adverse events the main issues around vaccines are that are statistically significant are the pain swelling related to the injection site. And um, as many of you will know, uh, you have to be very careful assessing um, an event around vaccination. Is it coincidence or is it related to the um, vaccine per se? And really to date, the focus has been, or the data has shown, this relates to the pain at the injection site. So really what I've just um, summarised very quickly is vaccine efficacy. So in other words, how well the vaccines work in ideal conditions in um, a clinical trial setting. Whereas vaccine effectiveness is when you've actually rolled it out into the community post licensure. And in a sense, it's different to uh, traditional infectious diseases because here we're talking about a virus that um, is transmissible, obviously, and quite highly transmissible, but the diseases that you see clinically on the whole take a long time to happen, except, of course, for genital warts. But still a long time compared to, say, a lot of other infectious diseases. So what are the measures? What should you be looking at? And there's a lot of debate. Should we be looking at disease endpoints? And we've heard cervix cancer is going to take a long time. So if we've used, in the trials, used surrogates such as SIN3 or ACIS or genital warts. There's also been debate about what about using virological endpoints. And this is another, um, uh, perhaps somewhat easier in some ways, although I must point out, it, it's going to give you an early indicator of efficacy, of effectiveness, but the prevalence is assay dependent. And I point this out, you can see that in the NHANE study, the first publication, they showed um, a prevalence of 27%. In the second follow-up, uh, 43%. So what's going on here? If you look very carefully, they use different methodology. So you've got to use the same methodology in your approach. Prevalence is also population dependent. So if you're comparing pre-vaccine to post-vaccine, again, the samples must be from the same sort of population. And then what does HPV DNA detection mean? It could be a real infection, a virologically productive infection, could have been deposition from the night before. 
So now I'm just going to show you some data from my own country where the vaccine um, it was uh, licensed in 2006 and the government agreed in a school-based program to pay for the vaccine to young girls 12 to 13 years of age as an ongoing program. So this has been ongoing since April 2007 and we had a catch-up program from 13 to 18 and then as you can see on the right hand side community-based or general practitioner based um, to 26 years of age. Now in terms of coverage, and I only have coverage for 2011, but you can see in the 12 to 13 year old, pretty good coverage, 73% for three doses. It was obligatory to report this, the coverage of the vaccines, but you can see down at 20 to 26, about 52% of the older women received one vaccine. And in fact, this is an underestimate because it's not obligatory for general practitioners to report the vaccination to the registry. But this is really what I'm gonna show you um, not published yet, um, courtesy of Basil Donovan, that of women um, under 21 years of age, look what's happened to genital warts. We hardly find them in the clinic anymore to teach the medical students. So really, it's had a dramatic effect. If you then look at men, and I should add that our program does not include men yet. It will incorporate men from February next year. But look, there's an effect there as well. So this is herd immunity um, on the, uh, from the women to the uh, young males. Not only is it genital warts, but in PAP, abnormalities, if you look at histologically proven pap abnormalities, and this is an ecological study, you can see in the younger women, and we have pap screening uh, from uh, two years after first sexual debut or 18, um, every two years, and you can see here a, re a significant reduction. This is just from Vic one state, Victoria, but if you uh, look across the country. So these are high grade abnormalities by age. And if you look at the blue bars, again, in the younger age group, the under 20, um, a reduction in high grade dysplasias. So we're getting an effect trickling through there. And so um, more recently, and I do um, suggest you go and listen to uh, Sir Pierre Tabrizi, who will talk about this in more detail. But we've also looked at genoprevalence in, in a pre and post vaccination population. And you can see the blue bars, this was a survey we did in women presenting to family planning clinics before the government actually rolled out vaccination. And then we repeated this in the, some of the same clinics um, using the same methodology, same laboratory methods. And here you can see um, for, for the vaccine-related um, types, a 77% reduction. So, and this is just an interim analysis. So it's, uh, you know, I think really underpins if we can prevent the infection, we'll ultimately prevent disease. And um, in one analysis in the paper, which is just out, the pre-vaccine group is over here for um, the prevalence of the different genotypes. This is post-vaccine. Then if you come here and look at actually asking the young women whether they're vaccinated or not vaccinated, you can actually see even in the unvaccinated compared to the pre-vaccine, there's a difference. So we're getting a herd immunity effect. Not that we want to tell the community that we still want these girls to be vaccinated. So I think that's pretty exciting news. So I think somebody mentioned in the earlier um, part of this session uh, this morning about equity and getting vaccines or screening across to all communities that, are, that should be um, eligible. And certainly in our organized PAP screening program, this uh, is the graph of uptake of our cervical screening PAP program. Um, according to the socioeconomic status. And you can see that the, the less um, well off are much less likely to take up vaccination. 
uh, in contrast, and I suppose it's not rocket science, but you can see here across the different um, groups um, for vaccination, there really is no differential. And this is probably underpinned by the fact that this is a vaccine that is distributed freely by the government through the schools, so it's made very easy, if you like, for um, delivery, but really um, better equity in many ways. So we've got some challenges with our PAP screening. Now, what I've showed you to date, <coughs> excuse me, I hope my voice lasts to the end of the talk. What I've shown you is really Australian data and um, I don't have time to go into the rest, but there are now other, um, other countries also presenting, sorry, um, their data on impact on genital warts. And um, for example, New Zealand has shown um, a significant drop in genital warts in the vaccine eligible age group. Uh, there's similar data from the US, from California. They're from uh, Germany, from Belgium. So um, I just put that up as a summary to say we are now seeing uh, vaccine effectiveness um, in public health programs. So I think in concluding, um, we have great clinical trial data. This is translated into public health gain. And I guess really what we want to see, and as was discussed earlier this morning, we really need to see a, a global impact on disease. And I'd like to point out that um, with vaccination, just as with PAP um, screening, coverage is so key of the right population. Um, and, is, and, and I think really uh, is the reason we have the data we do. To do that, however, as uh, again was mentioned this morning, political will to endorse such programs and then to sustain them um, is also uh, necessary. So um, I finish there. Thank you very much.